This video is made possible by Curiosity Stream and Nebula. Sign up with the link in the description for access to both for less than $15 a year. The Flamingo. Alongside the platypus and BTR-80, these pink birds are the most beloved semi-aquatic things out there. They're pretty much like if some poor bird got stuck in Willy Wonka's taffy polar. If you do not, for whatever reason, like flamingos, I'm sorry to inform you that there are over six species of these noodly birds. The two species around Africa and Eurasia, and four species throughout the Americas and Caribbean. The only continents they don't live on are Australia and Antarctica, so if you don't like flamingos, you can go there instead. But why have flamingos spread so far? Why do they stand on one leg? And what about lawn flamingos? All this and more we'll discuss on this episode of BioArk. Flamingos live in colonies of up to thousands of other birds, making shorelines and lakes look like someone is throwing a baby shower. Speaking of babies, flamingo moms and dads raise their chicks and build nests out of mud together. Usually, the actual copulation happens while the pair is building a nest. But oftentimes, other couples will come and interrupt by trying to usurp the nesting site. That would be like if you were building a crib with your wife and then another couple barged in to try and evict you from your house. Luckily, for flamingos, having a baby isn't really a huge commitment. They defend the eggs while they're being incubated, but other than that, they just feed their babies with milk for a week or two. Yes, milk. Just like their fairly close cousin, the pigeon, and their very distant cousin, the honey badger, flamingos nourish their chicks with milk. And no, unfortunately, this isn't strawberry milk, but instead crop milk. A bird's crop is a second, muscular stomach, and flamingos' crops are well equipped with glands that secrete milk. Well, it isn't really at all like mammalian milk, except for that its secretion is also controlled by the hormone prolactin. It's really more like the consistency of cottage cheese, so it's kind of like young flamingos are fed yacked up cottage cheese for their first few days. And unsurprisingly, flamingo chicks leave their parents as soon as possible. They move on to find a posse of other baby chicks. And these groups are called crochets. They're kind of like groups of goths loitering around malls, but pastel. They band together to give their parents more time to forage and also also, more importantly, to make themselves less vulnerable to predation. Flamingos kept as captives in zoos will often feel anxious about being in groups that are only two dozen or so strong. So some zoos put mirrors around flamingo enclosures to make the birds think that they're in bigger groups and then will eat more. It's pretty much gaslighting birds into being less anxious so they don't die of starvation. So what's with the whole standing on one leg thing? Flamingos have long, spindly legs so they can wade deeper into the shallows than other birds and so they can access food sources few other birds can. But remarkably, they stand on one tiny leg at a time. Although they're big-looking birds, give or take a meter tall, they aren't all that particularly heavy. Only around 5 to 8 pounds or 2 to 3.5 kilograms. They even sleep while on one leg. It's a possibility that flamingos sleep with only half of their brain at a time just like dolphins do, so that they can keep one eye open for predators at all times. One other hypothesis is that they stand on one leg at a time in order to avoid pruning. Their webbed toes and legs pucker up after a long time in the water just like our fingers do. It might be that they keep one foot clear of the water so they aren't completely pruned all the time. But that seems like a whole lot of evolutionary effort just to avoid some raisiny ankles. Which, by the way, their ankle joints are actually where it looks like their knees are. So, if you've ever been told that flamingo knees bend backwards, the person who told you that is going to hell because they lied to you. Their knees, if you're wondering, are more hidden from sight within their feathers. Amazingly, flamingo ankle joints lock in place to keep the birds upright. Another possible explanation for their one-legged behavior is that tucking their legs up helps them keep warm while wading in chilly water, like how we wrap our arms around ourselves when it's cold out. However, flamingos keep up this balancing act in warm water and climate on warm days too. Potentially, they keep their legs folded up so their heart only has to pump blood through one leg at a time. Their legs are so long that it's likely their hearts have some trouble pumping blood through them. Plus, it would take less muscular effort and therefore energy to keep one single leg steady while standing than both. Indeed, both during cadaver studies and observations of living flamingos, birds tended to stay less while just on 
one leg. And speaking of standing straight, there are some flamingos that are not. Several same-sex flamingo couples have been spotted. Female homosexual flamingos will take turns incubating eggs. However, as these eggs are unfertilized since both of its parents are females, the egg will not hatch. But at least the moms had fun. Male pairs, however, are said to be model parents. Both incubate their adopted eggs and nurse the chicks with crop milk. While they might be great as parents, the way the dads got their eggs in the first place is a bit sketchy. Like I mentioned before, flamingo couples will often steal each other's nests because they're just too lazy to get their own. And male pairs will steal nests that already have eggs inside of them. Although, not all male couples are interested in having kids. Some have been spotted rolling eggs out of a nest they've usurped. They will, however, often just build nests themselves. Nests that are often bigger than the nests of their heterosexual counterparts, since males usually contribute more to nest building than females. And don't worry, there also exist bi and poly flamingos. These pink birds will sometimes form a triad, or a three-bird romance out of a female and two males. Apparently, in these scenarios, the males often seem more interested in each other than they are the females. Men before hens, am I right, fellow males? But flamingos don't just form romantic bonds, because their interactions with other flamingos in their colony don't seem random. This has led some researchers to propose that flamingos also have friends, even best friends. Several flocks of captive flamingos were observed over the course of five years, and the friend cliques among them were noted. Flamingos observed being best gal pals or best bros in 2013 still appear to be each other's best friends in 2016. When not hanging out or preening their mate or best same-sex friend, the bird will often hang around in the same trio or quartet of birds. And these bigger bird groups were also found to persist over the course of the entire five-year study. It shouldn't come as a surprise, then, that flamingo friendships can last that long because the birds themselves can live for decades. One flamingo kept at the Adelaide Zoo in Australia made it all the way to 83. And just like flamingos, their friendships go both ways. Because these birds might make friendships, but also foes. Holding grudges and going out of their way to avoid certain birds who, presumably, have wronged them in the past. Okay, so that's pretty cool and all, but why are they pink? Well, it's simple, carotenoids. Carotenoids are, as their name suggests, found in carrots and are what gives the tubers their famous orange color. But of course, flamingos aren't out in the ocean munching on sea carrots. Instead, these carotenoids are found in algae that tiny crustaceans like brine shrimp eat that are, in turn, eaten by the flamingos. Carotenoids are broken down in the bird's liver that are stored in the feathers. It takes baby flamingos a while to start looking really pink. And flamingos that haven't gotten enough nutrition tend to be paler pink, reminiscent of ill Victorian children. Flamingos are, remarkably, filter feeders. Much like whales, they have comb-like structures in their mouths that help them filter food. To feed, a flamingo bobs its head upside down in the water and switches it back and forth while quickly pumping water in and out of its mouth using its tongue. Along the inside edge of its bill, it has baleen-like structures that catch tiny shrimp or crustaceans or insects. It's pretty much like if you passed water through a Brita filter but dumped out the water and then sucked the mold spores and the dirt out of the filter. Okay, enough about flamingos eating food. Let's talk about flamingos being food. Back in the Roman Empire, flamingos were among the most prized birds, on a par with peacocks, and were considered delicacies. And luckily, Italian cuisine has since improved. Three ancient recipes for flamingo can be found in Apicius, or on the subject of cooking. Roasting it with egg sauce, roasted with must sauce, or simply boiled. For this recipe, FYI, it's noted that you can substitute parrot. Specifically, the tongues of flamingos were the real delicacy, like the maraschino cherry on top of a sundae. Pliny the Elder even references flamingo tongue in Natural History X. Isn't this fun to learn about right after we talked about how flamingos make friends? Farmers in the Roman Empire probably didn't raise these pink birds en masse the same way they did pheasants. They were most likely either specially reared for rich people like Wagyu cows are today, or were just kept as mostly decorative animals, the same way that oil barons in Texas like to cosplay as ranchers and keep, like, three peacocks and one tiger on their thousand-acre ranch. Or like Pablo Escobar. Escobar didn't only smuggle illicit substances. He also smuggled exotic animals for his estate, like zebras, giraffes, and, of course, flamingos. Although flamingos, in Colombia,
Arabia aren't exactly exotic creatures. That'd be just like taking one from Florida over to Georgia. But anyway, after Pablo's mm, peaceful passing, the animals on his estate were mostly rescued and redistributed to various zoos. Except for his herd of hippos. These hippos still cannot be stopped and continue to breed like rabbits in Australia. The hundred or so descendants of Escobar's cocaine hippos today are currently wreaking ecological havoc because of how hard they stomp and are terrorizing villagers, causing children to flee from their homes in fear of these hungry, hungry hippos. The Colombian government was going to slaughter these invasive giants, but the citizens of Colombia rallied together to protest, claiming that they didn't want the hippos to be killed because they were cute. To complicate the matter even further, at the end of October 2021, U.S. courts determined that the descendants of Escobar's cocaine hippos are illegally people, and it's unclear what effect this will have in Colombia. Flamingos may not ever be legally considered people, but they sure can fly. In 2005, a flamingo became a jailbird no more, breaking free of its captivity in a Kansas zoo. In 2018, that bird made its way to Texas, and other reports of that flamingo emerged from birders in Louisiana and Wisconsin. This flamingo spotting literally made headlines because outside of Florida, flamingos are a rare appearance. Well, except for on suburban urban lawns. Plastic flamingos are one of the most common things Americans put out on their lawn, alongside garden gnomes and grass. The first was designed in 1957 by Don Featherstone, or now, after his lawn flamingo fame, Don Feather Plastic. The first lawn flamingo's name was Diego, and these pink plastic wonders won Don a Nobel Prize in 1994. Or, well, an Ig Nobel Prize. The Ig Nobel Prize has been awarded to researchers, artists, and other notable people to honor achievements that first make people laugh and then make them think. Other notable winners of this award include Sir Andre Geim, who won an Ig Nobel Prize in Physics for making a frog levitate via magnetism, and then won an actual Nobel Prize in Physics in 2010 for other stuff with magnetism, and also the father of the hydrogen bomb, who won an Ig Nobel Peace Prize. However, I'm not sure if even the hydrogen bomb has had as much of an impact on American culture as the noble plastic lawn flamingo. They're so prevalent and beloved, you'd be forgiven for thinking they were America's national bird. But no, they are only the national bird of the Bahamas. So, why did flamingos spread so far exactly? It's either because they don't have raisiny ankles, or maybe it's the simple power of friendship. As you may have heard by now, the Curiosity Stream and Nebula Bundle deal is, in fact, an absolutely astounding deal. How great of a deal is it? Let me put it into perspective for you. For $15, you could get one single black ink cartridge. Or, with your year subscription to Curiosity Stream, you could watch thousands of fantastic nonfiction and documentary titles. For $15, you could buy lighter fluid and some matches and set stuff on fire, or you could simply watch the series Life on Fire as a legal outlet for your arsonist tendencies. For $15, you could get six bottles of ketchup and you could drink all that ketchup in one or two sittings, or you could dump that ketchup on the ground and roll around in it like a pig, or you could watch one of these thousands of nature documentaries. You could eat 15 $1 bills or just sign up for Curiosity Stream and also get a year subscription to Nebula. What's Nebula? Let me break it down for you. You could buy 0.00025 Bitcoin, or you could watch exclusive videos by your favorite smart indie creators like Real Life Lore and BioArk. You could get this small inflatable pool with a dolphin that will watch you while you fill it with eight pounds of bananas and stomp on them with your feet or derriere, or you could just watch exclusive titles like Real Life Lore's Modern Conflict series, and get access to all BioArk videos early and ad-free. Look, you could either ram your head into a wall repeatedly, or for just $15 a year, you can get access to both Curiosity Stream and Nebula. It's an easy choice. Click the button that's on screen now to sign up, and thanks for watching.